Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. She was growing into a teenager and was living then in the obscure village of Nazareth in Galilee. She gathered the grain during the day and tended the lamp laid into the watches of the night. Her father knew the dedication of her work, her mother the kindness of her heart, her friends the curve of her smile. She stood on the threshold of womanhood. Among all the girls in the village, she had been noticed, chosen, betrothed. A child bride before whom lay only possibility. Her father could walk with pride in the city gates. Her mother could rest in the comfort of her daughter's future security. But then he came, unexpected, unannounced, spoke openly and without shame of pregnancy, virginity, and a son. Things men never discussed, and women only whispered about behind closed doors. She questioned him about the particulars, but not about the promise. She knew the prophecies, and the angel's words rang true. She would be scorned and rejected, labeled as an adulteress in whispers and glances. There would be no more carefree walks to the market, no more happy trips to the well. Four hundred years her people had waited for hope, but God had been silent. Now he had spoken. The wait was about to end. Forty weeks, and then...
next song's a little bit more traditional. Maybe it'll be a little easier to, to sing along with this one. Let's go ahead and sing <clears throat> with the angels from so long ago. Let's sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the sky singing this evening. Go ahead and have a seat. At this point in our service, I would like to invite all of our kids to come up on stage. We have a special story that we want to read to you. So if you consider yourself a kid, um, feel free to come on up, and we're going to have you sit right up here on stage. Go ahead, come on up. Parents, if, uh, if you feel it's necessary, you can join your kids up here. Come on up. You can sit right down up here. This is Jesus Calling, The Story of Christmas by Sarah Young. The Christmas story began long ago, before the angel told Mary she would have God's son, before the shepherds and the, saw the angels and the wise men saw a star. God had a plan for Christmas. From the beginning of time, God's plan was Jesus. Count the stars, God told Abraham. That's how many children will come from your family. When Abraham and Sarah were very old, God gave them a baby boy named Isaac. Then Isaac had a son, and Isaac's son had a son, until Abraham's family grew all the way to Jesus. God's prophets talked about the Savior who would come into the world to save everyone who believed in him. Everything happened just like they said it would. God's ways and his timing are always perfect. God picked the right time for Jesus to come to earth, and he picked just the right parents for him. An angel appeared to a young girl named Mary. Don't be afraid, Mary, said God's angel Gabriel. Soon you will have a baby boy. His name will be Jesus. Nothing is impossible for God. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to Mary's fiancé, Joseph, in a dream. Joseph, the angel said, don't be afraid. The baby is from the Holy Spirit. Name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph woke up, he did just what the angel commanded. Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, was very old when an angel told her husband, Zechariah, that they would have a son, and they were to name him John. John spent his entire life showing people that only one person could forgive them of their sins and take them to heaven. That person was Jesus. Just before Mary was about to have her baby, Joseph had to travel to his hometown, Bethlehem. But there were no rooms left for them. In a stable where the animals were kept, Mary's baby, God's son, was born. In the stillness of the night he came, God's gift of Christmas, the one who would save the world. In nearby fields, shepherds were watching over their flocks. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord was shining around them. Do not be afraid, the angel said. I bring good news that will be to great joy for all the people. Today in Bethlehem, the city of David, the Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Wise men from the east followed a bright star. The star led the wise men to Jesus, and they were filled with great joy. We have come to worship your son, they told Mary. They presented her gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and worshipped him. The angel of the Lord appeared again to Joseph in a dream and said, You must escape to Egypt. Take the baby and his mother. King Herod has devised a plan to try to kill Jesus. You must stay until I tell you to return. Joseph obeyed. He took his little family and fled to Egypt for safety. When it was safe, Joseph moved his family to a town called Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus grew up strong and wise. He taught people about God and his kingdom. Jesus loved people more than anyone who has ever lived on the earth. He died so that all the bad things we do can be forgiven, and we can live forever with him in heaven. This Christmas, remember that God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to the world so he could spend forever with you. Jesus, God loves you more than you know. God's glorious gift of Christmas is for you. I love hearing Christmas stories from children's books. They have a, such a great way of simplifying the truth that is uh, for all of us. And uh, this Christmas, it's important to remember what it is that this season's all about. It's 
turn, the angels sing, the wise men brought an offering, peace on earth began in Bethlehem. Have we lost the reason that we celebrate each year? What is Christmas? If there never was a Savior wrapped in a manger, what is Christmas? If the angels never sang glory to the newborn King, what is Christmas without Christ? There'd be no glory in Excelsis Deo. What is Christmas without Christ? This is Christmas. It's all about a Savior wrapped in a manger. This is Christmas. Savior truly has come for us. And our next song, I invite you to uh, to stand with us again and sing about uh, how He has come and the joy that He brings us.
we do thank you for the fact that you have sent your son for us. We ask that uh, you would help us to remember the significance of what you've done. Help us to always remember, not just this time of year, but especially now, how precious you have made us just because of the fact that you sent him for us. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. You may be seated. Well, everyone, Merry Christmas. I want to welcome you all here this evening, and especially would like to welcome, if we might have anyone here, maybe for the first time, or it's been a long time, we're glad that you're here. You are our guest, and we hope that you are already enjoying your time with us for this very special Christmas Eve service. Now, as uh, I'm starting out my part of the service, I wanted to share with you something that I had heard on television several months ago. I had heard the news that this past October 30th of this year marked the 45th anniversary of the most historic boxing match in all of history. Some people would actually say that this was actually the greatest sports event of the entire 19th century. And for this sporting event, they set all kinds of records. There was a new record that was sent for television ratings because there would be over one billion people who would turn on their television sets to watch this event. Now, who were these two iconic fighters that were going to go at it? Who were these legendary boxers that were about to, to go to blows? Some of you might know the answer. Don't give it away. But I can tell you it is not these two right here. It's not them. <laughs> Some of you, um, I'm guessing, are probably sick of seeing that. <laughs> That's what they call a meme. And this is something that is going around all over the internet online right now. And all kinds of words that you find attached with this picture. Uh, and I would bet at this point it's had over a billion views. I mean, multiple times people are seeing this thing online. But it's not them, okay? So let's make sure we get the right picture here. This is what it was. It was the Rumble in the Jungle. How many of you remember that one? Anybody around for the Rumble in the Jungle? Yeah, and this one is going to pit the champion at the time. He was a young champion, only 25 years old, with an undefeated record 40 and 0, and having 37 knockouts. He was going to be fighting a much older veteran at the time, who was Muhammad Ali. And his record was 44 and 2, still very good. 31 knockouts. I don't know if some of you remember, Muhammad Ali came into this fight as a huge underdog. Huge. He was a 4 to 1 underdog. Those are terrible odds. But some of you might also remember that's part of where his famous rope a dope technique was used. And he would use the rope a dope technique. He would defeat George Foreman. He would become the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And from there on, was pretty much cemented in everyone's minds. They would call him the greatest of all time. Now, I have heard a saying, perhaps some of you have as well, and it, and it goes something like this Heavy is the head that wears the crown. That is certainly true of boxing champions. It's tough being a boxing champion because you have to make lots of public appearances, there's lots of publicity involved, and you still have to keep up your training. But something else that's very difficult about being a boxing champion, you know your days are numbered. It's a matter of time and someone is going to challenge you for your title. Most likely they are going to win. Somebody's going to win and take your title from you. That's why it's so hard to be a boxer as a champion. Their head can be very heavy as they wear that title. But this phrase, heavy is the head that wears the crown, I mean, it makes sense. That's also true of kings. The one who made that uh, saying famous, it wasn't quite that saying. A couple words that were different, but basically where we got it from was a play by William Shakespeare. It was Henry IV, part two. And kings can have the same problem because when you're a king, you've got lots of duties you have to fulfill. 
You have lots of worries. There's lots of problems in the kingdom. And kings also know that their days may be numbered. Back in the time of Jesus, it was very common that somebody would challenge a king for the throne. Perhaps another nation would attack and that king would be overthrown. And it was even common, kings would be killed. So we can understand why so many kings back then had such heavy heads as they wore their crowns. Well, with this information, that's going to create the backdrop for the story that we're going to look at this evening. Because tonight we want to have a unique look at the first Christmas. I would guess many of you are used to hearing about the first Christmas through the eyes of people like Mary or Joseph or the shepherds or the wise men. But tonight we're going to attempt to see the first Christmas story very unique through the eyes of a very powerful man. He was a client king. He uh, worked under the reign of Caesar Augustus. He ruled over the area of Judea and the Jewish people, and his name was King Herod the Great. So if you have your Bibles, I want to ask if you can turn to our main scripture this evening. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, and if you don't have your Bible, don't worry, because we're actually going to have the scriptures up here on the screen. You'll be able to follow along. I will be reading out of the NIV, the New International Version, for tonight. Matthew chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 6. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, pay attention especially to this next verse. Very important. When King Herod, King Herod, I don't know who that is. King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people. I can't help but wonder if maybe Herod was feeling somewhat like this boxing champion George Foreman was feeling. He was very on edge. And when he heard this news about this baby, I think this really shocked him and caught him off guard. He's probably wondering, a baby? Really? It's going to be a baby that's going to challenge for my throne? Not some king that's established somewhere that has this huge army and all of this power? I have to worry about a baby threatening me and my rule and my kingdom and my throne? Now, King Herod was obviously very upset and who else knew of this news? Look again at verse 3. Who else? King Herod and who? What does it say? All of Jerusalem. This whole city was talking about it. Somehow the word had gotten out. This baby, this king of the Jews, whoever this was, was going to be born. And the people were probably very excited about that because they were under oppression under King Herod's rule. And they had heard so many hundreds of years ago from the prophets that there was going to be this Messiah that's going to come, this Savior. Is this the person that the people think was being born? Well, the text tells us, yes, it was. We can know that for certainty because Herod calls together all the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and they would confirm, yeah, they're thinking it is the Messiah. It is the Christ child that is coming. Well, Herod knows, the people knows, know this. Herod knows all eyes are now on him. This baby has been born, this king, and was gonna be a threat what was Herod going to do? How would he respond? Look at verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, 
so that I too may go and worship him. Was this going to be Herod's response? Was he going to go and visit this king? Was he going to bend the knee and worship him? What's the answer? No, you guys know the answer. Look at verse 13. This is later in the story. It says, when they had gone. Now, who's they? This is the wise men. They had come to visit Jesus. They were at the manger, and they were leaving. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I call my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. I mean, so he is giving everything he can. Herod wants this baby killed. You know, there's a problem today around Christmas time, and, and I often hear this saying. People will say, I think Pastor Jason, you just sang about it. Where is he? Where'd Pastor Jason go? He's here somewhere. But we just heard this song about how you can't have Christmas without Christ. You can't have Christmas without the Savior. And always around this time of year, that's what we hear is, don't take Christ out of Christmas. You know, it's not Merry Xmas. That's not what it is. It's Merry Christmas. Christmas is about Christ. It's about Jesus. It's about the Savior. That's just what it is. But Herod didn't believe that. Herod would never believe that Jesus is the reason for the season because Herod didn't want Jesus at all. He wanted Jesus out of this world. There was no greater Grinch than Herod. Herod did not just want to keep Christmas from coming. He wanted to keep Christmas from starting. And so now you have a rumble. There was a rumble in the kingdom. Here you have Herod, who's on the throne, and this baby, who's supposed to be this king. What was going to happen between these two kings? What would be the result? Look at verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. I want you to notice something here this evening. Here was King Herod. This was the person who had the best chance, who had all of this power, who put in all of this effort to literally take Christ out of Christmas, and he could not get the job done. He couldn't do it. Herod would die, his reign would end, but Jesus would live on, and his kingdom still goes on to this day. What can we learn from this story? Well, many years ago, I, I took a class. It was actually a Bible class, but it had some historical value to it, too, because we learned about kingdoms. It was called Theology of the Kingdom. And here's what we learned, and this is true of all kingdoms in all of history. Every kingdom has four parts without fail. Every kingdom has four parts. Here they are. Every kingdom will have a ruler, a king, someone in charge, someone who has the power. Every kingdom will have a realm, land, boundaries. Every kingdom will have rules. There will be law. Here's what you will do, here's what you will not do, the way you will live. And every kingdom will have the ruled. Okay, you follow? Everybody with me? Four parts. A ruler, realm, rules, and the ruled. I have this theory, and I believe fully and 100% in this theory. And it goes like this. Listen carefully. My theory is that every single one of us, no exception, every one of us were born into this world with some level of believing that we are kings or queens, ladies, of our own kingdoms. 
Okay, let me repeat that. Follow me on this. Every one of us were born into this world with some level of believing that we are kings or queens of our own kingdoms. I'll give you an example of this. Did you ever see two toddlers fight over a toy? Did you ever see that? Take a look at the picture here. Did you ever see two toddlers fighting over a toy? Sometimes even at Christmas time? What's going on there? It's that belief. This is like sometimes rumble in the jungle too, if you've seen some fights between toddlers like this. I mean, I've seen some knockdown drag outs, whether it's toys or this is my room or whatever. And <laughs> there's this Christmas song. I think there's this part that goes like tiny tots with their eyes all aglow. I've seen tots that go at it. There's fire coming out of their eyes. You know, you've seen this, right? Have any of you seen fights like that? What's happening? This is one of Satan's greatest lies. And he, he wants all of us to believe it, which sounds like this. I'm in charge. This is my life. I can do whatever I want. So as a toddler, when it comes to the toy, it's my toy, little boy, and I'm better than you, and you better give me that toy soldier, which is like so 10 years ago, because today it's probably like, you better give me that electronic tablet or something, that Nintendo Switch, and if you don't, I'm gonna beat you up, right? That's what's going through the mind, even of a toddler. We're born with this. It's not just toddlers. Let me go up through the ranks. Teenagers. I have known teenagers. I've been a youth pastor for many years, well over 10 years, and I have seen teenagers go to war with each other and lose a friendship. And sometimes the things that they're fighting about really just doesn't even matter. It has no worth. It's not worth losing a friendship over. What's going on? Power struggle. Power struggle. My life, I'm in charge. I do what I want. Adults. You want to know where the greatest power struggle happens between adults? It's in the home, in the family, in marriages, husbands and wives. The power struggle. I want to do what I want to do. And how many marriages have ended separation or divorce because the husband or the wife wasn't getting his or her own way? What's going on there? It's the same thing. This is Satan's lie. This is what he wants us to believe. And I'm not doing this to condemn anyone because let's make sure we all understand, all of us struggle with this. Every single one of us do. Now I want you to understand this. When Jesus came into this world, he did not come to validate your kingdom. He did not come to validate your kingdom. Jesus' message for us was quite the opposite. There's nowhere in Jesus' message, you look through the scripture, he never says, hey, your life, how you're living right now, it's just perfect. The way you're leading yourself, the way that you treat other people, it's right on the mark. Great job, just keep doing what you're doing. That's not Jesus' message. Jesus' message is this. All the kingdoms of this world, all of them, no matter how big or how small, even if it's, if it's the smallest kingdom, even if it's just a kingdom of you, every kingdom of this world is messed up. Every single kingdom of this wor world is messed up. All the kingdoms of this world, even yours, are flawed. They're imperfect. And they're filled with hurt. They're filled with loss and pain and death. John 16, Jesus tells us these words. In this world, you will have trouble. 1 John 2, 17, the world and its desires are passing away. 1 Corinthians 7, 31, for the world in its present form is passing away. Look at the words here of Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. What's that? That's your kingdom. That's our kingdom when we're born in this world. It's a kingdom of sin. It's a kingdom of darkness. 
in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. See, at first, we're all like Herod. We don't want anyone to threaten our little kingdom. We don't want anyone to challenge us for our throne, the throne of our lives. We want to keep it. And I think that's why, at first, most of us, this is what we're seeking. This is what we want. We want to find something in this world, some person, some book, something that's going to encourage us or support us or validate our kingdoms. What you're doing right now, just keep it up. It's perfect. But that's just not realistic. That's why most people, most people will realize it's not working. I'm trying to control my own life. I'm trying to rule over myself. This is just not working. I'm trying the best I can, but there's all these problems. But is there some way I can salvage this thing? Can I still be the one who's in control of my life, who has all the power? Can I still keep my little kingdom somehow? And that's why I think so many people then come to option number two, which sounds like this. When we realize our personal kingdoms are flawed or weak or messed up, we're going to look for something that can allow us to keep our kingdom with some kind of impossible fix or improvement. I get it. I'm trying to lead myself. I'm, I'm trying to be in charge of my own life, and it's not working. There's problems. There's got to be some kind of magical pill I can swallow. There's got to be some kind of miraculous fix, but there's not. And Jesus doesn't have either of these two things as part of his message. This is Jesus' message to you. Yes, your kingdom is imperfect. It's full of sin. It's full of hurt. It's inferior, but... His kingdom is superior. His kingdom is perfect. His kingdom is eternal. And he is inviting you. If, if you don't know Jesus as Savior, if Jesus is not the king of your life right now, he is inviting you to be a part of his kingdom. But here's what you need to hear. This is so important. Listen closely. The only way that you can ever have any part with Jesus or his kingdom is that you have to be willing to let go of yours. You understand what I'm saying? You have to be willing to give Jesus the control. We had this fight between Foreman and Ali. There couldn't be two champions. When it comes to kingdoms, there can't be two kings either. Either Jesus is going to be king of your life, or you are. Who is going to sit on the throne of your life? Who is going to be in charge? Are you going to live for yourself or are you going to live for Jesus? Mark 8, 35 says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. John 12, 25, I think, has even stronger words, basically echoing the same thing. The man who loves his life this is the one that says, I love my kingdom. I love the control I have in my life. The person who has that kind of life is going to lose it all. But the man who hates his life, what does that mean? You hate yourself, you hate your, no, it's, it's not saying that. It means I hate my life with me in charge. It doesn't work. The person who, who realizes that I can't live this way, the person who hates his life in that way, what's gonna happen? He will keep it for eternal life. This is what Jesus is saying. Let me have your life. Give your life to me, and I will put my life in you, and you will have new life through me. Your kingdom doesn't work, so let me be your king. Will you give up your kingdom for mine? John 9, 39. Jesus says, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see who become blind. There are so many people that are still, they just, they don't want to believe that Jesus is the only way. So many people, they will remain blind. They will think, I can make this thing work somehow. I can get myself to heaven somehow. But you can't. John 18, 36 to 37. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, but my kingdom is from another place. I am a king. 
For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. That is Jesus' truth for you tonight. All earthly kingdoms, they are flawed, they are fading. The rule that you have over your life is also flawed, and your life is fading. But Jesus is inviting you to be a part of his powerful and his wonderful and his eternal kingdom. But if you want to come into Jesus' kingdom, you can't bring yours with you. You must submit control to him. That's why I want to issue an invitation at this time. If you don't know Jesus as Savior, if Jesus is not your king, I want to give you the invitation that he has already given you. Herod wanted nothing to do with an invitation like this. Why? Because he was threatened he was going to lose the power and the control. He didn't want some Jesus to shake things up on him. But make no mistake about it, when Jesus came into this world, he came here to shake things up. He came here to wake us up to the truth of himself. And I am hoping that tonight, maybe someone will wake up. This will be a wake-up call for you. Maybe there's someone here tonight, you're just sick of hearing about Jesus. Maybe you don't even want to be here tonight. Maybe somebody dragged you along. Every single Christmas, I always have to hear about Jesus. And you just want this talk of Jesus to just go away. You know, Herod did everything he could to make the talk of Jesus go away. And for thousands of years, there are so many people who have tried to remove Christ from Christmas, who have tried to remove Christ from the schools, who have tried to remove Christ from American society, and it hasn't worked. You know why? Because God won't allow it. God won't allow it. And here's another year, and here you sit in this church, and once again, Jesus is inviting you to his kingdom because he loves you. And he wants you to be part of it. John 3.16 tells you all that you need to know about becoming a part of Jesus' kingdom. It's the most well-known verse in history. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. What does it say? So whoever what? Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You need to realize that your kingdom is a kingdom of sin, that your kingdom is not working. That's why the Bible says we need to do something It's called repent. It, repent has this idea of turning from. We have to turn from our sin. We have to turn from our kingdom. We have to turn from our control as we turn to Jesus, as we turn to his kingdom and say, Jesus, we want you to have all the control. And I want you to know, if that is you tonight, and you're wondering, will Jesus take somebody like me into his kingdom? Someone like me, who's done the things that I've done? Someone like me, who has the reputation that I have? Yes, he will. Jesus will accept you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter your past, no matter your situation, no matter how messed up you think you are, no matter how messed up you think your life is, Jesus will accept you. He wants you to be a part of his kingdom. And so I want to ask for this. I have one thing I'm going to ask if tonight you'd like to put your trust in Jesus Christ. Very simple, what I want to ask. Because I want to pray for you. I would like to know your name, just me, and Pastor Jason, our worship pastor. We would like to know your name. We would like to pray for you, and I would like to send you a follow-up letter. Not gonna show up at your house. So here's what I wanna ask that you do right now. If you would like to place your faith in Jesus Christ and accept him as your king tonight, I wanna ask right in front of you, there's a white communication card. Grab that card right now. It looks like this. Grab that card right now. And I want you to put your name where it says name. I want you to put your address where it says address. That's all you have to fill out. If you want to fill out more, you can. And then it says here on the bottom, I am interested in the following. I want you to check the box that says, accepting Jesus as my Savior. Fill that out, and at the end of our service, we're going to sing a song. We're going to pass plates around for offering. I want you to take this card, put the card in the plate as it comes by you for offering time. 
and I want to be able to pray for you, and I want to send you that follow-up letter as an encouragement for the decision that you've made tonight. But for right now, what we're going to do is we're going to turn our attention to a candle lighting service. So we're going to start to make some lights go out here. Things are going to start to get a little bit dark as I'm talking. We're going to prepare for this. But one of the ways that Jesus shook things up in this world is that he brought light into this world that was already so dark. You see, without Jesus in this world, the reality is we're all blinded by the darkness. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6 says this, The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, Let light shine out of darkness, and made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Tonight we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate him as the light of the world. We celebrate his kingdom of light. But before we get started here, there are a few things that I want to go over with you. It's been a while since we've done a candlelight service here, so we have to go over some important instructions. Now, I've led a lot of candlelight services in different churches, and I've never had a problem with the smoke detectors. However, I have come to find out that the smoke detector in this building might be a little bit more sensitive and actually sensitive to candle smoke. Now, we've had some men who have been working very hard on getting that taken care of, and there shouldn't be any alarms going off. However, if something happens to go off, some kind of an alarm, don't panic. Everything is okay. We have people that are ready to silence the alarm, so just be aware of that. The funny thing was, Pastor Jason and I were laughing that as we're doing this candlelight time, we're going to be singing the song, Silent Night. And I was just imagining these alarms going off as we're singing Silent Night. So just be aware of that. Number two, all right, let's, let's practice here. We might be a little rusty. I knocked this little, what is this, a little Christmas tree? It looks like a little acorn or something. But I knocked that over. All right, everybody hold your candle. We want to make sure we do this the right way, how we pass the fire. Okay, if you don't have fire on your candle, how do you get it? What do you do? Everybody do this. This is how you get the fire, right? If there's no fire on your candle. If you have fire on your candle, what do you do? Right. So if you have the fire, don't do this stuff, okay? If you have fire, keep it, keep it straight up and down. That's good. Third thing, parents, just be aware. Watch if you have some children that are participating. That's okay, but just be watching them. You know, we don't want like hair catching on fire, but we also don't want the wax going everywhere. We want to try and keep the wax on the candle or on this little cardboard piece. If it gets on the chairs, the carpet can be very difficult to clean off. So, you know, don't worry about perfection or anything, but just parents help us out on that. And then lastly, we're going to be extinguishing our candles toward the end. There's going to be bins in the back. Just make sure you drop your candle off in those bins on the way out so we can use them again for next year. This time I would like to invite the worship team up as we prepare to sing Silent Night as we're turning off some lights here. I want to invite the three deacons forward as well who's going to be helping us with the candle lighting at this time.
go ahead and sing Silent Night together. Why don't you go ahead and stand with us as we do that? Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm. As you stand here, I want you to just kind of remember this image in your mind. I want you to think about how this light has spread throughout this room. It's a tremendous picture of how Jesus' kingdom has been spreading and how we have his light in us now if we've accepted him as Savior. And if we have his light in us, we need to let it shine. That's something we also have to remember, and I want to challenge you to do that. I want you to remember this candle that you're holding right now. And as you leave this place, I would challenge you to really be like your candle, to shine light into this dark world. Don't be embarrassed that Jesus' light is in you. Let your light shine. Matthew 5, 14 to 16, it says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So let's leave this place today with Jesus' light shining bright. You may extinguish your candle at this time. On behalf of Calvary Baptist Church, I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. 
I hope that your Christmas will be filled with love, with laughter, with fun, and especially thoughts of Jesus. I would encourage you, take time to celebrate Jesus tomorrow. He is the reason for the season. Our King has come. But before you go, let us continue to worship him with one final song, as, and we will be taking up offering at this time as well. And I just want to say to all of you, Merry Christmas. <clears throat> Gentlemen, if you want to come forward. <clears throat> like Pastor Joel just said, our offering is a chance for us to uh, express worship. It is something that uh, God asks us to do from a grateful heart, from generous spirits. If that is, is, is your, uh, your heart and your motive tonight, then great. If not, don't worry about it. We're happy that you're here with us and glad that you uh, took the time to be with us this Christmas Eve. But uh, you can give them the plates as they come by, or if you'd like, you can also go to uh, cbcnorwich.com, look for the giving tab there, and, uh, and you can give through uh, a debit or credit card that way. Uh, again, that is if generosity is in your heart, and that is how you want to help further the message of hope and of Jesus Christ. For now, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, sing a song that we started the service with, uh, Born as the King, It's Christmas. It is time to celebrate the fact that Jesus is risen again. Christmas time. 
Uh, we as a team want to send you out with a Merry Christmas. We hope that you've enjoyed the service tonight. We've got one last song that we want to sing with you. Thank you again so much for joining us. We do wish you a Merry Christmas. You are dismissed.